Good morning, everyone. Grateful, Earl, for you leading the song. As we had talked about it early this morning. I said, it's a song, Earl, that I have not heard us sing in a long, long time. Didn't realize maybe you had never led it before, but we're, but we're just fine. It's a, it very much is a song that I thought would help prepare our minds uh, for the way that we are to live in the service of our king. So I'm grateful for Earl doing that and for the good selection of the other songs that he had made as well. Glad that you could be with us today. We do have a few guests with us today, and always good to see you. And, and we have so many, as was mentioned in the prayer, uh, so many of our brethren that are still gone out of town, many that will be traveling uh, later today, and we want to remember them, especially in this uh, inclement weather. Uh, I was text messaging with uh, Sharon Neller early this morning, and they had planned to worship in uh, South Lake Tahoe this morning but the storm was coming so vigorously that they left very early this morning to try to beat the storm. As you can imagine, they're expecting a great amount of a snowfall. So I think they left about a little before 7 o'clock this morning uh, to, to, get, well, to get out of Dodge, so to speak. And so we want to remember all of these people uh, in, our, in our prayers. Uh, grateful for the reading that Zach uh, did for us a couple of moments ago. Interesting, as Zachary was reading that and as I was looking at the the ESV in this particular text and when you look at verse number five and those few among us that have the ESV as I have here it says but the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of rabble and formed a mob in all my life I have heard of those that were referred to as rabble rousers and that's exactly what you have here. And what really intrigues me about this passage, and I find it quite amazing, indeed intriguing, that when we look at these Jewish individuals, many of whom were following Paul from place to place to oppose what he was teaching and what Christians were teaching and believing, and when you look at their attitude and you look at their actions, they, these Jewish rabble-rousers, were aggressive. They were vengeful. They were unrelenting in their purpose. And what I find so amazing, as Luke records the words for us here of what these men were accusing Christians of, he says, these men who have turned the world upside down, have come here also. The rabble-rousers said that about Christians. These men, like Paul, like Silas, like other disciples of Jesus Christ, because of their faith, because of their teaching, because of what they were doing for the cause of the gospel, these Jewish opponents said, they're turning the world upside down. I want to tell you that's a bit of a paradox from this standpoint. These Jewish individuals, these men who had such animosity towards Paul and other Christians, they were trying to turn the world upside down for Christians. Doing everything that they could to stop the cause of Christ and the teaching of the gospel. But now they're accusing Christians, those sharing a message of good news, hope, and salvation. And what do they do? They negatively charge these Christians with turning the world upside down. The Christians persecuted no one. The Christians threatened no one. They imprisoned or incarcerated no one. They simply wanted to share a message that God had planned and prepared before the foundations of the world the message of hope that the world desperately needed. What makes it a paradox, though? Because I guess in another sense it was true. That when you take and you share the gospel of Christ to a bent, lost world, I guess the world does need to be turned upside down. Wouldn't you agree? 
It's a paradox. Because of these radical concepts of Christianity. I want us to talk about paradoxes today. And the very first thing that we might do is just say, what is a paradox and define it? And we sometimes use these paradoxes ourselves. We will make paradoxical statements. It is a statement that is seemingly contradictory or opposed to common sense and yet is perhaps true. We hear them all of the time. Now, categorically speaking, there are many different types of paradoxes in a lot of areas and fields that many of you have, have studied or devoted your lives to. There are mathematical paradoxes, scientific paradoxes, political, economic, philosophical, historical. There are so many humorous paradoxes. And I want to share just a few with you. Things that we hear, and sometimes after hearing it, we might even say, what was that? There's something that's actually called the absence paradox. And the absence paradox says, no one is ever here. Well, think about it. We think that sounds contradictory, and it is. There's something that is known as the historical paradox. And it's stated that we learn from history that we do not learn from history. Well, that's a paradox. There is what's known as the Socratic paradox, stated by Socrates, a Grecian philosopher. And he says, I know that I know nothing at all. Oh, is that right? And of course, he's making a statement, but do we understand then of how a paradox would work? There are other paradoxes that I've heard of, and there's just a few that I wanted to re re record that I wanted to go over with you. And when I was reading this one, looking at a lot of examples, I thought, this is just intriguing. Don't go near the water until you know how to swim. Good luck with that one. Or how about... Nobody goes to that restaurant. It's too crowded. <laughs> and then have you ever heard of this fellow? Yogi Berra? You all knew I was going there. Tim was hoping and waiting I was going there. And I just picked a few of Yogi Berra. And of course he said, it gets late early out there. Or he, when he said, if people don't want to come to the ballpark, how are you going to stop them? And then finally, and I love this one, if you don't know where you're going, you might not get there. You look at these, and these are statements that seem to defy common sense, and yet perhaps there's a degree of truth to them. There's something about that when you think about it, think it through, you think, okay, there is a message here. Do you know the Bible is actually filled with several paradoxes. And what I could have preached on, and I have preached on in the past, as I was thinking about this the other day, it was many, many years ago in, in, in Cayucas that I had preached a sermon concerning the paradoxes of the cross of Christ. And all of the paradoxes that what, what it took for our salvation, which Christ did, what seemed to be so contradictory to human nature. But what I want to do today is just briefly examine three spiritual paradoxes principles or concepts that are so contrary to the conventional thinking of the world. And they have to do with the way. And, and that's why I wrote led a song for us, The Way of the Cross Leads Home. And we're, we look at this and we're going to sing an invitation song a little bit later. Let him have his way with thee or with you. And the very first paradox that I want us to think that is such a true, true statement, spiritually speaking, when you think about this concept, is that the way up is down. That's a paradox. The way up is down. Now, what do we mean by that? And what we see taught consistently in the Bible and by Jesus himself is that the way to greatness to God. Now, there's the way up, right? The way to greatness to God is in Humility and humble service that we have to lower ourselves. That's down. And we think of Jesus' own paradoxical position. We know who Jesus is. He is the Son of God. He even sits now at the right hand of God. He has all authority. 
We understand that even during his personal ministry, the Son of God comes as the Messiah. He can work miracles. His teaching is perfect. There was no flaw, no imperfection, no sin in him whatsoever. And of, of all, of any entity, spiritual entity that has ever existed, is there anyone that is more deserving of honor and worship than Jesus? No. But here's the paradox. He said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. That's a paradox, do you see? And what he was teaching is that the way up is down. You will notice the statement that he makes that as we look at this in Luke chapter 22, in Luke chapter 22, and beginning at verse number uh, 24, Luke 22, 24, there Luke says in the narrative, now there was also a dispute among them, that is, among his hand-picked apostles, as to which of them should be considered the greatest. You know, that's so often a, a great paradox right there from the standpoint that the people, they, 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 they're looking for greatness, but they don't understand that greatness comes by virtue of lowering yourself, of being humble. And they were so concerned about their own position in the kingdom. And so there's a dispute amongst them. Uh, who's greatest? Can you imagine? The original apostles, disciples of Jesus Christ, they're concerned about their own position next to Christ. In verse 25, he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. He says, you know that's how it is in the world, in the Gentile world. Kings and potentates, oh, they have great authority, and boy, do they exercise it. And people are going to be subservient to them. And those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. Look at verse 26. But not so among you, on the contrary, who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. You think about this and these Semitic cultures and so many of the cultures of that day. You know who was to be the most humble was the younger. You respect the older. You respect the senior. The, the younger. You know, you know what, what, what was so often stated when, when I was a child? Children are to be what? Seen and not heard. You ever heard that before? Because what was kind of built into that statement culturally is that the younger, they need to humble themselves and they need to listen and show the respect towards the, the older. But what is Jesus saying? He says in verse 26, He who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. That was so radical. That's so contrary to think if you're going to be a king, be a servant. I tell you, I wish political leaders would understand that today. That they've been, been put in a position of what? Service. Not lordship. What does Jesus go on to say in verse 27? For who is greater? He who sits at the table or he who serves? It is not he who sits at the table. And then notice the position of Jesus himself at the end of verse 27. Yet I am among you as one who serves. Here is the sinless, perfect Son of God who comes to this world and what does he do? And think about this. Do you know what Luke 22 is? Where this is? It's in the upper room. He has just, he has just instituted the Lord's Supper. What had he just done before this? You can read about it in John 13. He washed the disciples' feet. Because he was showing his disciples and showing us how we are to serve. Because here's the paradox. The way up is down. Humility and servitude. Jesus had stated in John chapter 20. Or Matthew, excuse me. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 16. This principle. So the last will be first and the first last. That we should look at it that way. And instead of trying to jockeying ourselves around so that we come first, that we're put first, that we're going to be ahead of others, he says, understand the principle that the first shall be last. And if that's the attitude of the action, then as far as God's estimation, the first shall be last. But the last shall be first because it speaks of humility, you see. In his own life, Jesus taught us how to put others first. The Apostle Paul, he says in Philippians 2 and verse 5, that let this mind that was in Christ Jesus be also in you. That's Philippians 2, 5. But in the two verses that preceded that, in verses 3 and 4, Paul says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in loneliness, listen to it, but in loneliness of mind let each esteem or elevate others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but for the interest of others. 
the way up is down by putting others first, putting the interest of others, the needs of others, the thoughts of others before our own. The Bible says so much about humble submission in all the relationships, even by the example of Jesus and what Jesus had said, and prophetically this was noted, even as we find in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, it speaks of the relationship between Christ and the Father in heaven. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written to, of me to do your will, O God. When Jesus came, his mindset was so focused, it was such intention to do this. He says, I have come to do your will, O God. That's the example. What does the Bible say in the relationships, even between husbands and wives, and while we should esteem the other better than themselves, it too is one of submission and service. In Ephesians 5.22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. But the husband should so much want to provide for his wife, care for his wife, love his wife, lead his wife, be a good husband to his wife, even as Christ is to his wife his bride, the church, that the wife will gladly and lovingly submit. But we should not be worrying about who's going to come first in this relationship. It's an attitude of submission. The children, children, Ephesians 6.1, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. It's submission. That's God wants us to submit in these situations. And even earlier on in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21, that to all of the brethren, he says that we are submitting one to another in the fear of the Lord. We should be willing to submit to each other. Do you have a need? Do you have a care? Do you have a concern? Do you have a problem? Then what are we to do? That we should submit to each other. Care for each other. Put the other first. Because the way up is down. In humble servitude. Jesus, Jesus made it very clear. When we look at that final passage of this point in Matthew chapter 23, verses 11 through 12, Jesus said to his disciples, The greatest among you shall be your servant. No matter what position one may occupy in the body of Christ, what position, what place, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. God is looking for humble servants. Truly, the way up is down. What a paradox. But that's not the only way we need to consider. I suggest to you, secondly, that the way to have is to give. And that too is a paradox. All oh, the world in so many ways doesn't look at it that way. But the way to have is to give. And that is such a biblical principle repeated time and time again throughout Scripture. This principle, as we see, really agrees with so much of what we sometimes refer to as proverbial wisdom. And what we'll see in some of the Proverbs, and I have an example for you there in Proverbs chapter 11, verses 24 through 25. But generous blessings follow generous giving. Now, as I brought out in the Bible class this morning, even, in the adult Bible class, that the Proverbs are their general rules. It doesn't mean that there can't be exceptions, but the general principle or rule is this. That generous blessings follow generous giving. God blesses people who are generous. God blesses people that understand that the way to have is to give. And good Christians, children of God, understand this and will practice this. Listen to that proverbial statement. In Proverbs eleven twenty four. 24, and wise man Solomon says, One man gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly but comes to poverty. Verse 25, a generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. You know what it's about? It's about giving. And it's not just necessarily financial, monetary giving. That's a part of it. 
But it's giving of ourselves. It's giving of our time. It's giving of our energy. It's giving of our ability. And yes, it's giving sometimes of our finances. But here's the whole point. The way to have is to give. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, we need to always offer righteous judgment. We need to treat people with great equity and kindness and compassion and even forbearance. But here's the point, that what we give and how we give will so much determine of what we will end up having. Give, and it will be given to you, is the principle that Jesus states. And you know what this is in concert with? It is absolutely in agreement with, it's in harmony with God's law of sowing and reaping. That we're going to reap what we sow. I fear that as the ages, as the decades and time moves on, that a lot of the agricultural-based type of analogies and teaching used by Jesus and the writers of the Bible may be kind of lost you know, in the minds of many people. And we don't talk a lot today about, about sowing and reaping. But we just need to define that to people in the younger generation. What does it mean to sow? It means to plant seeds, right? And what does it mean to reap? Well, it means after you've planted those seeds and have been taken care of because of, of the water and the sunshine and it grows and it produces a crop. And what are you going to do? You're going to reap. That is, you're going to take in a harvest. You've got to work and pick those, those crops. But here's the point that's so consistent. You're going to reap just what you sow. And is that not true spiritually as well? We get out of something what we are willing to put into it. We try to teach that to our children when it comes to education or when it comes to vocation. That you've got to put time and energy and effort into things if you want to reap. That is, if you want to gain something positive from it. The way to have is to give. In 2 Corinthians 9, a passage I alluded to briefly as we took up the contribution this morning. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6, the Apostle Paul says, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. That's just good old-fashioned common sense. That's a common sense that a farmer understands. If he does not plant very much seed, he sure should not expect very much crop or harvest. You will reap just what you sow. That's what Paul says. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. But then when you drop on down to verse 10 of that same opening in 2 Corinthians 9, he says, Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. This isn't true just in physical things. It's true in spiritual things. The, the fruit of righteousness. Brethren, listen. If we want to have spiritually, to be strong and to grow and to prosper spiritually, to, to reach a, a maturity, a level of maturity, you know what? We have to give again of ourselves. We give of our time. We give of our worship. We give of every, our ability, everything that we can do. And it's, that's when we can really, that we can really reap a harvest of righteousness and spiritual growth. Here's the point. Being a Christian and being a part of the kingdom of Christ is a daily responsibility. It is not to be just a part or just one facet of our lives, that being a Christian is to be the very center, the fulcrum of our lives, that everything else revolves around what? Us being Christians and honoring God and following His Word. The way to have is to give. And you've got to give. You've got to give, again, of yourselves and all of these needs. Remaining in that text, in verse 11, while you're enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. And I'll tell you what, you know, we need to be thankful that we can give. We need to be thankful. Now, we must never forget that the way to have 
is to give. And while that may be a paradox in the way that the world views things, it is a spiritual truth, a concept or principle that we need to embrace. I want to go to our final, our third paradox. And inasmuch as the way up is down and the way to have is to give, I conclude by saying to you that the way to live is to die. What a paradox that is. Physically speaking, materially speaking, God has made us, built us to be survivors, to live. And we're all trying to avoid physically the inevitable, to die. Yet in the true sense of this paradox, what has Jesus taught and what has Jesus shown? The way to live is to die. And to die here can refer to a lot of different kinds of deaths or giving oneself up to the cause of Christ, to the cause of God. There is no doubt that this principle, that the way to live is to die, was one of the major premises and emphasis in the ministry of Jesus, which appears, I know, to many to be a puzzling paradox. Maybe not to us, but I'll tell you right now, to a lot of people in the world who think worldly and carnally, this is a puzzling paradox to them. I want you to think about Jesus' example. And again, we go back to, to the agrarian, to the agricultural, farm-based type of society and what people understood even about horticulture back then. But do you remember that teaching of Jesus in John chapter 12? Turn your Bibles and look over what Jesus said in John chapter 12, beginning at verse 24. And as he's, as he's dis- talking with his own disciples... And he affirms to them, beginning of verse 24, Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now we first deal with the analogy of Jesus and we know what happens. No matter what, it could be wheat, it could be corn, it could be barley, it doesn't make any difference. And you take that seed, you take that grain and you plant it in the ground, you put it beneath the surface of the soil. And what happens is it gets moist with the rain or with irrigation. As the heat of the sun is is upon that earth, in a little bit of time, what does that seed begin to do? It begins to decompose, to deteriorate. And it it, it literally has to die, but then something great happens. All of a sudden, the seed that appears to be decomposing, life emerges. Is that not an agricultural truth? And what does Jesus say? That's where we've got to be spiritually. We have to give of ourselves. We've got to be willing to experience a death. The death of what? The old person, the old way of life, the old practices, the old habits, the old condition. And how do we put that old man or woman to death? I tell you, we have to acknowledge that yes, our sin has separated us from God and in that death, we've got to get rid of that body and we're going to bury it. And where are we going to bury it? In baptism. And when we're baptized into Christ, and we're baptized into Christ in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of our sins, and here we are taking a physical body, and we're going down into the water, we're not getting rid of physical dirt, we're getting rid of sin, aren't we? And what emerges, what comes up out of that water? A new creature, a new person. The paradox, the way to live, is to die. Jesus taught in Matthew 16, 25 that whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That has to be our attitude. I will do that I want to do whatever God requires of me, that desires me. If that means that there needs to be a radical change, and I'm going to tell you right now, it's common among all of us. Because, listen, because of the problem of sin, we need a radical change. The life has to be changed. And so the result of dying is a new spiritual mindset as I just tried to illustrate we died with Christ when we were buried 
and raised with him in baptism. In Colossians chapter 2 and verses 12 and 13, Paul says, buried with him. Listen to it in Colossians 2, 12. Buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. The same God that raised Jesus from the dead when we have been baptized and we're immersed, and that's what it is. It's not sprinkling, it's not pouring, and when we are immersed in water in the name of Christ for the remission of our sins, God raises us from the dead. We didn't physically die. It was a spiritual death, and it's a spiritual rebirth. And you, verse 13, being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. I'm going to tell you right now, there's nothing more glorious than being risen from the watery grave of baptism to know that every trespass, every sin, every mistake, every flaw that we had ever had or committed in times past, forgiven. Forgiven. The way to live is to die. And then it's a new life. In verse 20, therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why as the living in the world do you subject yourself to regulations and, and going back to an old law that didn't work? I'll tell you what, it's a new life. It's a new direction. And so he goes on in chapter 3 of Colossians in verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ. I want to ask, have you been raised with Christ? In the context of Colossians 2 and 3, is raised with Christ how? Yes, you've confessed His name, acknowledged your sin, but you were buried with Him in baptism and raised up to walk in the newness of life. Have you been raised with Christ? If you've been raised with Christ, Paul says, seek those things which are above where Christ sits, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you died. He said you died. Do you remember when you died, spiritually speaking? I do. Do you remember when you died? When you put on Christ in baptism. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. It's a new life. It's a new direction. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's a new life. It's a new direction. It's new priorities. Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added to you. Brethren, I say to you, as passionately as I possibly can, paradoxically indeed, the way to live is to die. Well, the way up is down, and the way to have is to give, and the way to live is to die, and those are paradoxes that are just absolutely supported by Scripture. And we've got to see it, and we've got to live it. We've got to do it. So I close with this thought, with this question, actually. Is Christ's view of greatness upside down? Be careful when you answer that. In one respect, certainly because he knows everything, it's not. But in another respect, it is as the world views it. Oh, it's upside down. And so if we believe it and we hold to it and we teach it and we live it, maybe we will turn the world upside down. Brethren, Christians serve to be great. And Christians give in order to have. And Christians die in order to live. Not to our own glory, but to God's glory. And so it is in another sense. It's the world that's upside down. And the gospel of Jesus Christ will turn it right side up. I hope we'll believe that. And that we'll live that. Let him have his way with thee. Is the song of invitation. Have you been raised with Christ? You can be today. You can be baptized into Christ. But let him have his way with thee. If we can help you with any spiritual need. Please let that be known. Won't you come at this time as we stand and sing the song that has been selected.